so I just prepared, um, I have 27 slides, and um, they talk just a little bit, a, a brief introduction to the immune system so you can get a little bit of a context as to what IVIG is and how it kind of fits into the immune system. Um, we'll talk just a little bit about how we think it works and um, a little bit about dosing um, and then some tips and tricks that we've developed over the years for people who are getting IV, um, IV infusions. And then we also have a patient here who gets subcutaneous or under the skin um, immunoglobulin, which is kind of an up and coming thing for myositis um, that I actually have not put a patient on it. So um, you all will have more information about that, the panel. So when we talk about the immune system, the immune system is very complicated. Um, the way that I kind of like to think about it is that the immune system is basically made out of, uh, in a simple level, it's made out of white blood cells and it's made um, by, of antibodies and other proteins. Um, the important thing to know in the word myositis or dermatomyositis is that the itis means inflammation. And inflammation can be a good thing. It can be when your white blood cells or antibodies go to attack the strep bacteria that's in your throat, giving you strep throat. Your immune system makes inflammation, and that inflammation is like inflammatory chemicals that kill a germ. Then the white blood cells eat the germ up, and then everything calms back down and goes back into balance. So that's healthy inflammation. In, in autoimmune conditions, inflammation happens for no good reason. It gets stimulated either from genetic reasons or environmental causes or a combination of many things that causes your immune system to fight, in this case, in the um, in inner lining of blood vessels and in muscles and in skin. So um, the immune system, the way you can kind of think about it, can you see my pointer? Okay. Um, so we don't have to worry about the names of all of these cells, but I did put in some numbers. I don't know how many people are familiar with, um, now that people have my chart, you can see your lab results online. If you ever get flow cytometry and you see things like the NK cells, CD56, if, if that sounds familiar at all, um, some of this might make sense to you. So basically, um, white blood cells are this line of cells here. So when we do a complete blood cell count, when we're just looking at blood cells, We'll, we'll get your red blood cells um, and platelets, but we also then get white blood cells. So white blood cells are all of these kind of rainbow colors here. Um, lymphocytes is a percent of your white blood cells, and there's different types of lymphocytes. So there's B cells and T cells and natural killer cells. So you've heard about rituximab today. Rituximab takes out B cells. Some of our other medications like methotrexate work on all of the lymphocytes. Um, and for this talk, what's important is that B cells can differentiate or change into something called a plasma cell. And plasma cells have these little antibodies that are Y-shaped um, sticking out along the sides of them, and they actually produce antibodies. So this is going to be the part of the immune system that we're talking about today because IVIG um, is a collection of healthy antibodies or antibodies from a large collection of healthy people. And then different um, white blood cells produce chemicals called cytokines that are inflammatory. So we heard this morning about different medications that block <laughs> chemicals like tumor necrosis factors. So these are medicines that are um, advertised on TV all the time, like Enbrel and Humira. We don't use those as first-line medications for patients with juvenile myositis um, because there are some reports that it can actually make myositis worse. But in certain situations, those TNF blockers have been used. We also can block chemicals called IL-1 and IL-6 and interferon. So you heard about the JAK inhibitors today, which um, work on the interferon pathway to block that chemical. So that's just a, a basic overview of our immune system cells, but we're going to be focusing more on these antibodies. So just to, to think about um, the fact that dermatomyositis is something called a vasculopathy. So in rheumatology, um, we take care of conditions that cause blood vessels to be inflamed or irritated. So vasculopathy is where the immune system, white blood cells or antibodies, are attacking on the very inner layer of a blood cell, of a blood vessel. And even in the, in the capillaries, capillaries are tiny little vessels that only have one cell layer, but on the inside of capillaries is where dermatomyositis attacks. And in the skin, our skin has blood vessels that are kind of deep in the skin tissue, 
and they have these little blood vessels that turn into capillaries that come right up to the surface. And that's where inflammation happens along the lining of those tiny little blood vessels. And that's part of the reason that patients get rashes when they have dermatomyositis. Right there. One of the places in the body that we can actually see those tiny little hairpin curves of um, blood vessels is up at the skin right near your fingernails. So everywhere else in the body, those little capillaries come up perpendicular and make a U-turn right at the surface of your skin. But where your skin moves into your fingernail, those capillaries run parallel to the surface of the skin. And that's why you can see these little, little curves right along the edge of the fingernail. So that's what we're looking at um, when we can actually visualize those nail fold capillaries with a little dermatoscope. And I brought mine if anyone wants to look at their nail fold capillaries later, if you're interested. Um, and this is a, a place that we can judge how much the immune system is actually affecting the little blood vessels in dermatomyositis. So that's your brief introduction. So we can talk now about IVIG. So like I said, um, immunoglobulin is the same terminology as antibody. So an antibody is an immunoglobulin. And there are various classes of immunoglobulin. Um, there's class G, which is the IVIG, um, is is gamma globulin. There are other immunoglobulins as well. So they're IgA, IgM, IgE, and they all have different roles. Uh, the one that we're concerned about is IgG. So antibodies look like this. So there are these large proteins that are kind of in the shape of a Y. And antibodies were first discovered, the fact that they exist, maybe we knew about them before then, but in the 1940s, we were able to actually pull them out of the liquid part of blood. So the liquid part of blood is called plasma. So blood is, is made out of liquid and cells. So when you're able to separate out the cells, then you have this liquid part of blood, and that's where immunoglobulins or antibodies float around. Um, so um, this plasma was used to treat soldiers from infections and injuries in World War II. And then they found that when you put um, immunoglobulin in a shot and administer it as like an... A, um, um, a vac not a vaccine, but a shot, it goes into the muscle or intramuscular immunoglobulin. It prevented and treated measles and other infections. So they realized that it had some antimicrobial properties. Um, but it was thought to be unsafe back at the time because of potential side effects from it. In the 50s, an immunologist discovered a type of um, of immunodeficiency called X-linked agamma globulinemia in patients who are unable to make antibodies, and so that puts them at high risk for infections. And they found that these patients didn't get infected if they got immunoglobulins. Nowadays, 75% of the IVIG that is produced is actually used for autoimmune diseases, um, rather than the, the other small percentage would be used for patients who have immunodeficiencies where they don't make enough or don't make any antibody but we in rheumatology are, are taking over a lot of these, the use of IVIG. So again, that's just a picture of what, what goes into blood and the fact that we're able to extract the antibodies from the blood and put them into little vials. Um, when, when companies are making IVIG, they take blood from a large, large pool of blood donors they spin out the blood cells and you're left with the plasma. And then they add different chemicals to the plasma to extract certain parts um, of the components of the proteins that are within the plasma. So they take out one fraction that has fibrinogen, which helps blood to clot. And then they take out two more fractions after adding a couple of other chemicals. And those are the immunoglobulins that are in that part. Um, so it goes, it's a long process to actually get through and get the blood filtered out so you can extract all the immunoglobulins. And what you're left with is a bag of fluid that has the antibodies inside. So there are different products on the market, different um, drug companies or different companies that produce immunoglobulins. And this is an old slide. There's probably some other ones at this point. Um, and you may have heard that there is a shortage of gamma globulin or immunoglobulin um, IVIG preparations right now. Um, in my hospital in Colorado, we, um, our hospital brand was gamma, gamma Unex, and we had to change it to Gamma Guard recently. That kind of seems like, and you guys can probably answer this better, but um, depending on what, your, what 
company your hospital contracts with, they may um, have a shortage of the supply or may to need to order from another company. And an important difference between the different formulations is that the concentration of immunoglobulins is different. Um, mostly, they contain IgG or the class G of immunoglobulins, but some formulations have IgA as well. And then there are other things, other chemicals inside um, that are like sugars, um, and those are different in different products. So what we know about how IVIG works is that it's really complicated. So one thing we know for sure is that these antibodies don't suppress the immune system. So medicines like prednisone or steroids um, and medicines like methotrexate or Cellcept actually reduce the ability of white blood cells to fight. And so therefore, you know, they're not fighting against your own body. Um, gamma globulin works differently in that we, it actually helps to fight infection. So your child probably has a normal amount of immunoglobulin in their body, and then we're adding this extra amount of antibodies from healthy people. And it works a lot of different ways. So remember I showed you that the immunoglobulins are kind of Y-shaped. And at the ends here is where um, they bind to foreign proteins. Every antibody is, is designed to fight against something very specific. So we have antibodies that fight against all kinds of different proteins within, for example, the strep bacteria. Our immune system knows not to make antibodies that fight against our own cells for the most part. Sometimes it gets confused. It makes all kinds of antibodies. And if it does make ones that fight against our own cells, the immune system knows how to delete those antibodies. In autoimmunity, part of the problem is that we're making antibodies that react against our own cells. So the idea when you get immunoglobulins or antibodies from healthy people is that you have a lot of good ones, and they block receptors on other cells. They cause certain cells to be depleted or to, to kill off cells that are auto-reactive against yourself. The antibodies bind other antibodies. So if you have a lot of antibodies in your blood that are unhealthy antibodies, the good antibodies bind them and make them neutralized. They also bind some of those cytokines, like we talked about TNF or IL-1 or IL-6. Um, and all of that comes from the binding region. And then there are other effects from the tail end of the Y. Um, so cells have receptors for antibodies. So antibodies can bind onto cells. So when you have a cell um, and you bring in a bunch of healthy antibodies, they take up all the spaces on the cell so other bad antibodies can't bind. Um, so they saturate the receptors. That can also cause more healthy cells to come in. The immune system cells that regulate the immune system can then come in and regulate or balance out the immune system a little better. Um, so there are a lot of different ways that the antibodies work to make the immune system work a little better. And I can't claim that we understand all of those ways that it works, um, but these are just kind of theorized ways that the IVIG is helpful. So there are not a lot of published studies about using immunoglobulins in dermatomyositis. Um, there are a couple of studies that are a little bit old, but I can just summarize very basic. Um, a, the group in uh, Canada at SickKids in Toronto put, looked back at their charts of 78 juvenile dermatomyositis patients who received IVIG. So, they looked at their patients, all of their JDM patients who were in their research database from 1991 to 2005, and they had 135 JDM patients in their whole clinic population. Then they looked um, and decided who are the ones that we want to include in the study. So they had to exclude 57 of those patients. 22 of them were before 1991, which was before they started using IVIG. 12 of them they didn't include this in the study because their diagnosis was unclear, so they didn't want to confuse things. Um, 10 of the patients came to them after they had already been diagnosed and treated, so they wanted more of a pure population that had all been diagnosed at this one center. And then a few patients hadn't been seen enough times at the center, and in five patients were just, I don't know if they refused treatment, but they didn't get any treatment for their disease at all. So the patients who were left are the ones that were studied for this, and 30 of those patients received IVIG, and 48 of them did not. Of the 30 who received IVIG, 14 of them were considered to be 
steroid resistant, meaning they were treated in the usual manner. So they got steroids, and most of them got methotrexate. And within the first six months, if they were not responding well to um, that treatment, then they were considered to be steroid resistant. The other 16 patients um, were called steroid dependent, SD. And they were considered to be steroid dependent because they responded to their treatment, but as the steroids were weaned down, then they flared. And so after six months, if a patient was either steroid uh, resistant or steroid dependent, that's when they decided to add IVIG for their treatment. So this was back in the time when some doctors felt that the only time you should use IVIG is when a patient was either resistant or dependent on steroids. And what they found when they looked at all of these patients, they were one of the things that they were wondering is patients who achieved disease inactivity across time. And the patients who received IVIG are the darker line. And it, was, it took them longer to achieve disease quiescence than the patients who did not receive IVIG. And that makes sense because the ones who got the IVIG were the ones who either didn't respond at all or didn't respond well enough to the steroids. So it took them longer to get better. It doesn't mean that the IVIG was a bad treatment for them. It was that they were sicker to begin with and they needed the IVIG to help them. So that was an expected finding. Um, so by, more, by about 10 years, patients in both of the groups were doing very well in this center. And then the second thing that they looked at is something called a disease activity score. And whether you know it or not, your, your pediatric rheumatologist is probably either formally or informally in their head calculating a score of how active your, your child's disease is. So that takes into consideration how weak they are, what their blood tests look like, do they have elevated enzymes of muscle, does their skin look active. So they calculated a disease activity score on all of their patients over time. So at every visit, the patients had a little score. And what we see here are the patients, the controls are the top bar, so those are the diamonds. And then all of the other patients are the, the um, squares with the dotted line. Those patients received IVIG. And there's two groups of that IVIG recipients, the ones who are um, steroid resistant and the ones who are steroid dependent. So what it looks like over time is all patients tended to get better. Eventually everyone gets better because their disease activity goes down, score goes down over time. Um, the patients who were steroid dependent, it took them longer to get better and they received IVIG. The patients who are steroid resistant, which is the line on the bottom here, um, they also got better over time. They fared a little bit better than the patients who were steroid dependent. Um, but it looks like there wasn't a big difference in terms of how patients got better, whether they were on IVIG or not. But remember, the ones who got IVIG were sicker to begin with. Another study out of the same institution um, looked at 38 JDM patients who received IVIG just to, to um, understand a little bit about the safety of treating patients, JDM patients with IVIG. And this study was published in 2008, and they looked um, at patients who received different um, brands of IVIG, depending on what the hospital had available at the time. And the, this table shows the frequency of adverse reactions, or basically patients having bad side effects to their IVIG. And what they found is that patients who had um, bad reactions like fever, headaches, um, lethargy, feeling tired, nausea, or vomiting, they tended to be getting the type of IVIG that had more IgA included in it. Remember, IVIG is mostly IgG, but some brands have some of the IgA subclass. It doesn't mean that the ones that contain IgA are bad, um, but just for some patients, they had more of a reaction when there was IV, um, IgA included. So many of you know already about the side effects that can happen with um, IVIG. So patients can develop an infusion reaction at the time that the um, immunoglobulin is being infused. It can cause things like headaches, fatigue, flushing, or flu-like symptoms. It's very unusual for a patient to actually have a true allergic reaction. That's what we call anaphylaxis, where you get swelling in your throat, 
um, hives, itching, a lot of histamine all um, being released throughout the body. And that tends to happen more in patients who don't make any IgA at all. So it's a possible um, thing, a, a, um, I'm forgetting at the moment exactly what percent of the population, but it's a fairly large percentage of the population whose immune system just doesn't make IgA. And in those patients, they actually might make antibodies against IgA. So if they get IVIG that has some IgA in it, then their antibodies can attack and they can develop kind of an allergic reaction. But that's unusual. Other side effects that happen from IG, IVIG, something called aseptic meningitis. So meningitis was where you have inflammation of the lining around your brain and your spinal cord. And aseptic mean it's not, means it's not coming from an infection. So a patient looks like they have meningitis, like a bad infection, like their terrible headache and their neck gets stiff, but there really is no bacteria in the spinal fluid. Um, the, the reason that that happens is not well understood. It's thought that either those antibodies are crossing into the, through the blood-brain barrier and into the, um, the lining, and that causes an irritation, or potentially it may be due to some of the extra chemicals or sugars that are in the IVIG. Um, but the patients get bad headaches, get sick, vomit, and many of them have to be admitted to the hospital to reduce that inflammation. We know that when patients receive a large amount of immunoglobulins that get um, absorbed into the bloodstream, that makes their blood a little thicker. In theory, that can increase your risk for having clotting or thrombosis. Um, it's very unusual in kids to have problems with your kidneys or renal failure from, from all of the salts and sugars that come into the bloodstream when you get IVIG. It's a, it's a, a bad reaction that tends to happen more in adults. Hemolysis means rupturing of blood cells. So if, the, if um, you have blood cells in your bloodstream that become coated with a lot of IVIG, a lot of immunoglobulin, that can cause blood cells to rupture. Um, and so a patient could become anemic. That's also a rare um, side effect. Um, there is a theoretical risk because it's a, a blood product. So you have blood donors who donate and the IVIG comes out of that donated blood that there could be an infection transmitted, but the blood is screened very, very, very carefully, so it's an exceedingly low risk of having some type of an infection contracted through the blood product. And then another extremely rare reaction is called a transfusion-related acute lung injury, or trolley, and that happens for another reason that's not well understood but basically, patients develop a lot of fluid that rushes into their lungs very quickly and causes damage to the lung tissue. Now nobody wants IVIG, right? <laughs> so I always, when I tell families about side effects of medicines, we always talk about the importance of thinking about the benefits versus the risk. So all of those risks are actually quite low, and the benefits of IVIG modulating the immune system without suppressing the immune system are pretty good. So... It, it works out in its favor, I promise. Um, just really quickly, a, a little word about dosing. How do we know how much IVIG to give someone? So we do it differently. So you, you saw Dr. Reed's presentation this morning where she showed one of the graphs where they um, surveyed a bunch of physicians and they said, These patients all, this patient has moderately severe dermatomyositis. What medicines would you give to treat them? and people answered all different kinds of things. Um, if you asked a bunch of rheumatologists how much IVIG would you give someone, you'd probably get a few different answers. So one thing we know is that when you give below 400, milli yeah, 400 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, that basically helps to replete the number of immunoglobulins that you need to help protect you against infection. When you give a larger amount, that's where it works more to modulate or change the immune system. All of those little mechanisms from the, the tail of the Y and the, from the, the arms of the Y, um, you really need a lot more immunoglobulin to cause that modulation of the immune system. So what we agreed upon for our care protocols is that we would use two grams for every kilogram a patient weighs up to a max of 70 grams. Some rheumatologists don't hit them. They, they go above the max. They'll give two grams per kilo no matter what someone weighs. Um, some rheumatologists will just give one uh, gram per kilogram. And, and all of that is considered okay and appropriate because we really don't know what is best. 
Um, we often run the infusion as long as possible. So the longer you run the infusion, the better um, side effect profile in terms of the developing transfusion, infusion reactions or aseptic meningitis. Um, and we decided for the protocol that we would at first give the IVIG every two weeks for three doses and then move to monthly. And um, there is no specific end date, although most people kind of try to do seven infusions and then see what happens. Some um, rheumatologists will then um, wean down in terms of perhaps the amount of IVIG or will start spacing out the infusions um, after that. And some people just stop after six or seven infusions. Um, I'm almost done talking here. So a newer thing that has come um, become a thing over the past few years is the ability to deliver um, immunoglobulins instead of through an IV underneath the skin. And we'll have a demonstration of what that looks like here. Um, we, it's used quite frequently in patients who are immunodeficient because they don't need as much of a volume of IVIG. So they're just getting 400 to 500 milligrams versus two grams. So like maybe a quarter of the dose that a patient with um, uh, autoimmune disease would get. Um, what some differences between doing it both ways, when you give subcutaneously, you get more of a consistent amount of immunoglobulin going into the bloodstream over time versus doing it IVIG, you get a big bolus of the antibodies right into the bloodstream. Um, there are some studies looking at how effective it is to give patients with um, myositis, and there are also studies looking, more studies looking at patients who have immunodeficiency or not enough antibodies, and they're finding that those patients seem to fare about as well, at least the immunodeficient patients. There are only a few studies that kind of look backwards at myositis patients who have received um, subcutaneous Ig, and they seem to fare well. Um, whereas with IVIG, we have a long history of experience saying that it works. The side effects are much less frequent in patients who are getting sub-Q IG, so that's a reason that it may be something that we do more frequently in our patients as time goes on. Um, and in terms of cost, IVIG can be very expensive because it's usually infused in an infusion center. Some people get IVIG at home, so that's a little bit cheaper, but depending on your insurance company and the way that your doctor contracts with hospitals or infusion centers, um, it can be very expensive to get IVIG. Um, and it's probably cheaper getting your home infusion sub-Q. And then just patient satisfaction. We'll hear from a satisfied patient, it sounds like, rather than having to go to an infusion center and spend one to two days um, being able to do your infusion at home and have fewer side effects is a big bonus. Um, so just at the last few slides, just talking a little bit about tips and tricks for patients who are getting IVIG infusions. We talked about some of these side effects that can happen. Um, blood cells breaking open, the rare side effects of blood clotting, the rare side effects of kidney dysfunction, um, and then also the aseptic meningitis. So things that we can do to prevent those or help make them not as bad is to make sure that a patient is well hydrated at the time of getting their infusion. Um, if a patient has had problems with formulations of IVIG that has high sucrose, then we can change to a formulation that has a lower concentration of that type of sugar. Um, we monitor blood tests to look for changes in red blood cells, changes in white blood cells to make sure patients aren't having reactions. Um, and in patients who, um, teenagers, um, women who are getting estrogen-containing birth control, um, estrogen actually increases clotting risk, so it is a theoretical increase in clotting risk with IVIG as well. So it is a thought that you may want to avoid estrogen-containing products just to keep your clotting risk lower. Um, the risk for meningitis, for aseptic meningitis, goes a lot higher when patients get a high dose of IVIG or when they get a rapid infusion. Um, the other transfusion reactions... Um, Symptoms like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, fevers and chills, achiness and rashes or itching typically resolve within a week. 
and we can minimize those when we hydrate a patient well. Some patients, we give them a bolus or a large kind of burst of IV fluids before they get the IVIG, and we can slow down the rate of the infusion. Other things we can do um, would be to, to change the brand to something that has lower, lower sugar, um, lower kind of chemical um, thickness. And then we can also do pre-medications with Tylenol, diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl. Um, some patients will do their IV steroid infusion at the time of IVIG because that helps to reduce the inflammation that can be caused. And some patients respond well to a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. Some patients uh, will give IV Ketorolac or Toradol during the time of their infusion or have them take NSAIDs for the next few days after their infusion. So I'm going to ask each of the people on the panel to just introduce themselves. Well, Meg, we already know, but um, and just what their experience is with IBIG, really. Just give us a frame of reference. All right. So my name is James Sheets. I am a clinical pharmacist. Uh, I've been working with IG now for just right at 15 years. Um, I own Home Infusion Pharmacy. I started my first one in 2005. Started dealing with autoimmune patients back then. Um, Five years ago, I um, actually founded CSI Pharmacy, which is Clinical Specialty Infusions. And our, our whole idea is we specialize in IG. That's what we're, we're built around. It's 80% of what we do now, so it's really a core therapy. Uh, work a lot with some of the, the different rare disease groups and patient, patient communities. It's my first time to be at CureJM, so this is, this is great. And it's our second time to be here. Michelle uh, has really got us engaged with this organization. Um, but yeah, I'm willing to answer any of your questions or look forward to, to hearing what you have to, to ask and say about you know maybe changing brands or how to minimize some of those side effects or uh, shortages or uh, whatever may come up. My name's Maddie. I was diagnosed with JDM when I was 17 and I started right away with IVIG. And um, as I was going off to college and we were trying to think like how this would work. And um, during that, I actually, three of the side effects that were listed up on the board happened to me uh, more than once. And I, we started the um, Solumedrol beforehand and the fluids and nothing was really working. And it was seven hours a day for the week and or for the weekend, sorry, uh, once a month. And when I moved to college, we I obviously didn't want to come home every weekend for a month, or for sorry, one weekend once a month. And so we met these lovely people, and <laughs> they told us about sub Q and how now I only have to do it once a week for about maximum two hours and I haven't had a single side effect since and I don't have any pre-meds. I don't have to worry about making sure I'm so hydrated beforehand to minimize all the headaches. And yeah, I'm probably going to just start doing it <laughs> and show you. Hi, I'm Michelle Vogel. I'm a patient advocate for CSI Pharmacy. I've been working with the myositis community since 2003, and I, I have been advocating for patients since then. I've worked on insurance issues, love navigating health insurance, so anybody who has any issues with insurance, just let me know. Also work on shortages, so I'm here to answer any questions on shortages for IVIG. Um, and I'm here just to listen to you and be here to help you. I'm glad someone likes working with insurance companies. <laughs> <That's> a weird <laughs> hobby. Um, my name's Colleen Marquetta. My son Jackson was diagnosed when he was two, and we started IVIG exactly six months after he was diagnosed because some of the other meds weren't working on their own, although he did get better. But um, now he is seven, so we've been doing IVIG for four and a half years. I've experienced some really strange side effects. I say I, but my son has. I've been there for it, and um, he's doing really well now. I I think I've figured it out for him <laughs> what works best, um, and 
we're still going. Right now we're doing every six weeks, so we started it every three weeks. My question is, is can you do IVIG if your child has high platelets that they don't know why they have high platelets? We know that platelets are what makes our blood clot. And um, sometimes when people have an elevated number of platelets, it's high because of inflammation. So we call platelets an acute phase reactant, meaning that it will go high when your body is inflamed, like C-reactive protein or sedimentation rate, fibrinogen, things like that. Um, I have definitely seen a group of JDM patients who have elevated platelets, and that has always been my assumption is that it's the reason why. But there are other reasons that you can have high platelets too. I think the question is, is the amount of platelets that a patient has, is that actually enough to increase their risk of clotting substantially? If it's just a fairly mild elevation, I don't think that's a, a, an increased thrombotic risk, so it probably wouldn't be dangerous. It theoretically could be a reason that someone might think to round down the dose a little bit rather than giving the complete two per kilo, but I don't think we have ev any evidence as to whether that would be necessary or not. Yeah, just a couple of points on that is, uh, let's say the platelets are elevated, the physician thought, um, hey, this is, we probably sh you know, could go with IVIG here is what we want to do. Um, there's some things that can be done to minimize the risk of the thrombosis. Um, first of all, I can start with uh, uh, product selection. So there's 10 different uh, brands of IVIG. They have various amount of uh, what's called osmolarity. And so we could, we could actually base the decision off of that and pick one that we think would be um, uh, less likely to increase the plasma viscosity. Uh, another thing is actually that, that I've seen done is lowering the dose um, whereas it might be two grams per kilogram once a month, lowering it to one gram per kilogram every two weeks. Uh, you know, so, uh, and then again, subcutaneous is another route that you'll, you'll see um, to help prevent the risk of thrombosis. So in regard to the IVIG shortage that's going on, um, so we get home infusions. Our brand has not yet been affected. Um, but our nurse mentioned that at most labs and blood collection sites, every time they do the testing, um, they don't always save the plasma, and very often it gets discarded. Is there something that we can do, like with CureJM, can we lobby to make this a law that they must keep all of the blood product so that we can make more IVIG? There's two different ways that they collect plasma. So you have plasma collection centers, and then you have blood where you donate blood and they separate the blood and plasma. Most of the plasma that's used is used from plasma collection centers. And so the manufacturers own those plasma collection centers and you'll see them um, all over the place where they're collecting it. And it, I've contacted the FDA and I've contacted the, de um, the Department of Health and Human Services, the blood czar, to see if the shortage is due to plasma collections it is not due to plasma collections. But yes, it's always good for people to be donating plasma as well as donating blood because we do have shortages of blood. And because we pay donors to donate plasma, sometimes we have actual shortages of blood. I was just gonna add to that really quick. So yeah, they, they, we do throw away, our plasma does get discarded some in the beginning and a lot of that has to do with the testing and the pre-screening and so, a patient goes in and donates plasma for the first time, that plasma is not used because it's being screened and they have to go you know, several times to get through that process. Um, so, so that is part of it. So what is the shortage then? <laughs> that we're checking into, but um, the official um, reason that the manufacturers are giving is because of increased demand. Is that truly the case? I'm not sure. Um, the, the three brands that the FDA has on the list of official shortages are GammaGuard, QVTRU, which is a sub-Q product, and GammaPlex. Doesn't mean you can't get those products, but those are on the official shortage list. Why you are seeing shortages in the hospitals is that um, all brands have some limited allocations, so that means that the distributors have 
done what they're supposed to do, make sure that no product is seen on the shelf and it's getting out to the hospitals, getting to the providers, and that's getting to the patients. But when they see shortages, what they do is they try to prioritize patients and they get nervous. So I've called children's hospitals to see what's going on when I saw that patients weren't getting treated. And what the pharmacists have said in many cases that they're prioritizing patients and they're immediately putting it to patients who have primary immune deficiencies because there's no other treatment, Kawasaki's disease, and for transplant patients, and in some cases, they're shutting down outpatient infusion centers. What you need to do is let your doctor know and ask to have your um, son or daughter be on the priority list if they haven't shut down the outpatient infusion center. That's number one. Now, Ken, if your brand is not being allocated anymore to that hospital, that's a problem, and that's not in the control of the hospital, and that may be a product switch. And if that's the case, and they tell you that the product's being changed, then the doctor needs to be known. You need to know, let the doctor know so that the protocols are put in place so that there's no adverse reactions to a brand change. But those are all concerns. And then on the summer months, every manufacturer shuts down the factories to clean the processing. So we always see some supply dwindling down during the summer. Um, but I will let CureJM know what I find out over the next weeks. And we're hoping to have a big meeting in Washington, D.C. in August to find out officially what's going on and we'll be posting information. I was just gonna explain really briefly what it means to give something subcutaneous because I'm not sure if that's clear for everyone. So when, when you get, obviously, IVIG, you start an IV and the little plastic catheter goes directly into your vein and the IVIG goes directly into the bloodstream. For subcutaneous, Underneath our skin, I showed you that cross section of skin, we have a bunch of sub subcutaneous tissue that's kind of fibrous tissue and fatty tissue. And so for subcutaneous, there's a little tiny needle, right? And it goes just under the skin, but it's not going directly into a blood vessel. And the, um, the IVIG formulation has some chemicals in it, which maybe you can explain better, that actually kind of break down some of the subcutaneous tissue to make it a little bit easier for the fluid to sit in there with the immunoglobulins, and then those immunoglobulins slowly get sucked into the bloodstream. So it eventually makes its way into your bloodstream. It's just not all at once. Yeah, so like one, one of the subcutaneous products, there's now three approved, and one of the early ones was Hacuvia, and um, it was actually a 10% solution like IVIG is, so it required a lot of fluid to get the dose. And so they did have another agent you would mix in called hyaluronidase, that uh, would, would facilitate the absorption or actually the deposit of that subcutaneously. The, the newest products are 20% and they don't require the hyaluronidase um, and you're able to give half of the volume for the same dose as you would with uh, Hacuvia. With that, we'd love to give Maddie show us um, of how this is done. Again, if anybody's squeamish, although it doesn't sound like it's gonna be necessarily an IV type of thing. So do you wanna talk it through? And Hi everyone, my name is Brittany and I'm a nurse with CSI Pharmacy and I'm gonna walk you through Maddie's process here with subcutaneous administration of Hyzentra. And like James said, it is 20% concentration. Um, so we are doing Maddie's dose right now at one gram per kilogram. Uh, originally she did start at two grams per kilogram, uh, which was her max dose with IVIG as well. Um, but we broke it up into weekly doses, and in the beginning, she was doing twice a week, and um, so now she's down to once a week. So right now, Maddie is inspecting her vial. <laughs> uh, she's looking at the expiration date. She looks to make sure that it's clear and there's no particulates floating in there. And then what she's opening now is what we call the um, mini spike or vented spike. And that will get attached to a 60 cc syringe. And the vent's important because we have a glass vial and we have to allow the air escape in order to draw it up, um, much like insulin um, and the process with that. 
Now the spike is a plastic needle, so you do have to be mindful of sharps. <laughs> so right now Maddie just inserted the spike and she'll draw up the Hyzentra, the IG product. Maddie, you may have to hold it up. There you go. <laughs> How long have you been doing subcutaneous work? Um, so Maddie's been completing subcutaneous IG since the fall, October, September, October, um, when she started college, her first semester at college. So what the pharmacy does each month, they call Maddie and they say, Maddie, it's time for your shipment. And Maddie will say, I need um, additional supplies if she needed Band-Aids or additional alcohol preps or something of that nature. Um, but they send her month's supply um, when she's due. And it's FedExed overnight in secure packaging with a cooler bag um, and it's protected in bubble wrap and everything of that nature. Um, so it's, it's very quick and easy, efficient delivery. And right now she's um, going to take out what we call the flow rate tubing. So this is going to control the rate of the infusion. Um, there are several rates that we can choose from. Um, she, Maddie, are you doing the 900 or 1200? 900. So she's doing uh, the medium speed, if you will, uh, for rate. And um, her normal dose takes her about two hours. I usually get a lot more, but for a time, I'm only going to do a couple right now. Um, so then what she's going to do is connect the actual administration set. Uh, she has a four site set. We have sets that go from two sites, four sites, six sites, and eight sites. And that is dependent upon your dose and patient preference. And the technique with sites, so anyone who's familiar with administration of, of medicine via IV is to bleed your line or get air out of your line. In the case with Hyzentra and subcutaneous products, that is under the manufacturer guidelines, it's not required. It's a very small amount of air um, that would be in the line. Now you can bleed the line like Maddie's doing now, um, but we want a dry needle. Dry needle is important because IG can cause irritation to the skin surface, um, which can burn, um, itch, cause some redness. So it's really imperative to make sure we get that dry needle and just not push the fluid all the way out is what, is what that means. And so now Maddie is ready to prepare her sights. Um, Maddie's going to use her thighs. You can use your abdomen, the uh, flank area, which is in your lower back, as well as your, the back of your arms. Uh, we're really looking for places that have a little more of the fatty tissue. And so each site you'll prepare with an alcohol prep to clean the surface of the skin. It's more of the absorption. Um, and, oh, sorry. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want more fatty tissue than more of the muscle area? Yes. Um, it it does af affect the absorption for the for the patient, and it can cause a little more pain um, if it were to be more muscle. Um, so in our smaller children, that's hard. Uh, we do have young children on Hyzentra um, in primary immune as well as um, myositis. Uh, we just pick areas that have a little more fat. Um, so that can be a challenge, and we look for, for ways to minimize that. Um, so then Maddie takes the needle and inserts using, there's little butterfly wings that you hold um, to, to kind of get a grip to pinch the pinch the needle, um, and then you pinch the site just to get a, a grip. Sorry if you guys can't see. Is she really doing it? Yes, yeah, she's, yeah. she really is. Is similar to an injection of like a methotrexate, like the angle of the needle? 
It's a 90 degree angle, so it's straight in. The needle um, is a lot smaller, I think. It, it is, and not I think, it is. Um, but also, I, don't, I can't even feel it when it goes in. So the needle size um, is 26 gauge and 27 gauge. We have two different uh, needle lengths uh, and gauges. So um, they're very small. Usually, we, um, Maddie's has the nine millimeter length needle, um, but we do have six millimeter as well as three. Um, so for the really small patients, uh, we use the three millimeter or the six millimeter. And for the average patient, um, we use the nine millimeter, and it does go up to 12 in our larger adult patients. And so then it's secured with a tegaderm, which is just that clear plastic window similar to an IV placement. And you can get up and move around. Now, you cannot run around, um, but you can uh, walk to the bathroom. You can go to the kitchen to get a drink and, and things of that nature. Um, there's a little carrying case that the pump goes into. So she's not walking to class. Yeah. No, I have. <laughs> <laughs> so the question was, can she walk to class? <laughs> um, so Maddie has done that, she said, um, but it, it's not recommended to just walk <laughs> to class. Um, I do not recommend patients do this in the car. <laughs> I didn't want to miss my freshman biology class in college, and um, I just I woke up one morning and did it, and it was going a little longer than I expected, not because of anything that the pump did or anything, just because of my time management skills. <laughs> so being a biology major, I just walked in, and everyone's like, oh, cool. So mm -hmm. it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> so like I said, Maddie's doing four sites, um, two on each leg. Now you can do one site in your leg, one site in your abdomen. Um, you can mix it up. The Hyzentra, there's an Hyzentra app as well as a journal um, that you record your sites, you record how much, the time, and um, any reactions so that you can present that information to your provider. Most of the providers like the app because your phone is always with you versus the actual journal. Um, but it's a very nice app and journal, whichever you choose to do, and you mark your sites because uh, it's imperative to move your sites. You know, you can develop scar tissue, so we do like to rotate. She's almost done, and she didn't cry. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Not yet. We have not finished. She's got to finish putting the needles in. <laughs> So the question was, if you receive multiple injections, do you have long-term pain? Am I saying it? Yeah, like um, triggers a, like a chronic bleeding or pain in, in an area because of the infusion volume to one area of medication to one site. So it could be an issue with the worst pain and not be the average. As far as pain later, no. Mainly what you would build up would be the scar tissue. And so when you try to insert a needle into scar tissue, that can be painful. Um, every now and then, your nerves may kind of, you may feel it a little more because you're more sensitive on the nerve endings. But I haven't seen any patients, and I'm a patient myself on sub-Q, um, I have not experienced pain after long-term use. For primary immune deficient kids who have been doing this for years, the only thing that we say is that, I mean, you would need to rotate it so that fluid build up. So you want the welts and you don't want to have scar tissue or fluid building up in the same areas. So it, it gets absorbed. So we just want you to keep on rotating it and not putting it in the same place over and over again. 
So now Maddie is ready to get started. So the pump that we use, and I favor because it's no batteries, uh, no electronics. It is a syringe pump, and she's going to wind it up. It's like a toy. <laughs> And so then she'll insert the syringe, and when she turns it on, it's gonna make a loud noise that will go away. <laughs> so now it's meeting the plunger, and now it's infusing. So it's quiet, you do not hear it, um, and then you'll notice once the syringe is empty, and in Maddie's case, she'll change the syr syringe out because her dose would be more than one syringe on a normal infusion. Um, and so now she's, she's running, she's infusing, and she's connected. Maddie, you wanna stand up? See? Um, so she's got tubing, she can put it in a bag and go, go around the house or to class if she chooses. No. <laughs> um, so she will develop a little bit of a nodule where the fluid is going into on each site um, that is absorbed in roughly about 24 hours. Um, usually you'll see about 21 mLs per site in most of our infusions. 25 would be the max per site. Um, so that is sub-Q. Um, it'll absorb and um, we'll go from there. Maddie does get blood work routinely. Um, she's supposed to get blood work every month. <laughs> um, so we just put labs in at, at, at the local lab office, and the patient would then complete them there, um, and, and they're good. So that is Hyzentra and Sub-Q. The one thing I did forget to mention is that um, for this infusion, for Sub-Q, nursing comes to you and teaches you, your child, or any other family member, um, and you become comfortable and familiar with the supplies, how to set it up and administer together for the first time. If you need additional help, then we come back a second visit. Um, the patient or the, the parent are never left alone until they're comfortable, and they have access to the pharmacist, and they have access to nursing. So we really try to make sure that everyone is comfortable with it before we just say, oh, here you go, go infuse. Um, so I just want to let you know that as well. I was just wondering how this compares cost-wise with getting an IVIG and um, any issues with health insurance approving it versus approving IVIG. Yeah, so that's a terrific question. Um, the cost is really co comparable uh, to IVIG. It's really similar, um, almost identical, in fact. However, you do not have the nursing component, um, so that'll be usually lower the bill a little bit for the insurance company. I'm speaking on, from perspective of in the home, which subcutaneously is usually in the home, but uh, that's, that's the billing and cost that I'm familiar with. So they're almost the same. The second question was, yeah. Insurance is a little more tricky. Um, you need to do prior authorization. We need to submit journal articles. There's not a lot of journal articles on this. Um, what we're planning on doing is doing, um, we have two kids on sub-Q right now, and what we're hoping to do is do, um, a, do a poster and do studies on this and publish. So, and we're doing all of our sub-Q. So we have a lot of sub-Q patients on, who have myositis that are adults, but we have two children. We have a six-year, five-year-old, and now 18-year-old. So we're doing retrospective studies um, and that we can also publish that so that it'll be for insurance data so that the case studies will be helpful for insurance. But basically, if, if the child has had side effects, that helps um, with insurance. And some insurance companies look at it because for the autoimmune CIDP, it's now covered for sub-Q, so that's helped a little bit. And since the adults have been able to get it, it's helped. Um, but it's case by case, and if you submit a lot of information, 
you have to fight for it. I may have missed this in your presentation, but um, if you are, I guess, predisposed to thrombosis, is that how you say this? Um, does the sub-Q, does that have anything to do with it at all, I guess, is the, is the question. Yes, yeah, so the an answer to that is in theory. <laughs> you know, so there's, uh, we actually have just submitted an article on a, uh, on a patient who had just had a pulmonary embolism, a thromboembolic event, after having IVIG. Um, she was on estrogen, uh, so she had some, uh, some other factors uh, involved there. Um, talked to the physician who wanted her, the, the patient very much wanted to continue because uh, IVIG was very effective. And so we talked about subcutaneous. Uh, you would think in theory a much lower risk because the idea behind the thrombosis is you're getting this high plasma viscosity with all this I, IG that's being infused at once, intravenously all at once in a higher dose. Well, now you're splitting it up into uh, a fourth of the dose at least if you're doing it from every four weeks now to every week. Um, and it's subcutaneous where the absorption is slow. So in theory, yes, um, we really don't have a lot of support evidence for that. It'd be a great study um, because uh, that, that would be really, really super. I wonder with inpatient IVIG, it changes for insurance. You have to get the approval before they change the brand. So um, I have another concern then if we, if we did change to sub-Q, and insurance approved it, then what if, you know, it doesn't work out and then you have to go back to the hospital and then they have to get pre-approval again? You know, I mean, once you, once you start and do one thing and you're approved and then you stop doing that and go to something else, how easy would it be to get back to that, you know? If, if you go from IVIG to sub-Q, you can go back to IVIG and you can go from site to site. So basically... Your insurance is approving it from two different parts. So basically, if you want to do IVIG in the home or in the hospital, that's your choice. And it's, choices are fantastic. And this is another issue that's a big pet peeve of mine is when your insurance forces you to go to one side of care than another. And I hate when even they're forcing you to go to home infusion and you like to go to the hospital or the infusion center, you shouldn't be forced to, and some are forcing you. But if you decide that you wanna do, um, you wanna do subcutaneous, and um, we're not we're not promoting sub-Q, because if IVIG works for you, then that's great, and that should be what you should be on. But if that's something that you did want to go and your doctor wants you to try and it did not work, then your doctor can prescribe IVIG either in the hospital setting or in the home infusion setting. That would not be a problem for your insurance to go back and approve it. Not at all. It's just like doing a brand change. As long as it's on the formulary, it would not be an issue. I have, an, I have another question. Um, when we first started doing the IVIG, our doctor said that we could not do the IVIG infusion at a smaller hospital. We had to be at a children's hospital. Um, now it's coming out with, let's do the IVIG at home. So, I mean, that is a huge difference. And I am very concerned about that. Um, and then my other question is for Maddie. When you do rotate your sights, do you always stay in your legs? Yes. <laughs> so in terms of going from the children's hospital to a smaller hospital, it may have also been in terms of where you have privileges and no, um, just one possible policy. possible policy, but yeah. So again, it's about preference and in terms of where they want you to go and where your doctor feels you to feels that they're most comfortable with you being at. So that's a discussion for you to have with your physician. Did you deal with any side effects getting IVIG at the hospital? And just to let you know, I am an ER nurse as well. Um, she has side effects every month. That's why we couldn't switch to home. It was just too much of a risk. She has we, side effects, she has side effects after. Like we have it two days after. Okay. We've had both, and we were told by our doctor it's just not 
even an option because it's not worth the risk. And I feel safer yeah. <laughs> being at the hospital, exactly. so. Exactly. Yeah, the use at this point is almost 50-50 between uh, inpatient and physician infusion suites in the home. And the, and the home is common, used to it. The home was 20% and it's, it's kind of going up, but it's, it is very common. Uh, but like Michelle said, it's an individual choice based on the individual patient. Everybody's different. Uh, so it's what's most appropriate for your kiddo. So Maddie, you said that like for time, like you're only doing one. So like do you, since you do more, could you just switch out the syringe? Like you don't have to stick yourself again? Yes. Yeah, so I, so right here it twists off and I just prepare another syringe and twist it on. Okay. Have you had um, adverse reactions at home from patients who are getting their home subcutaneous infusions? So commonly we, we have had patients with headaches. Um, usually we know to slow the rate the next infusion. Uh, we start with a max rate for most of our adult patients <laughs> at between 160 and 180. Um, now for our pediatric patients, it's lower. Uh, we would start wherever the doctor would like us to. If the patient was already on um, IVIG in a clinic, we would follow their protocol um, and move, move to that. So not a whole lot of side effects in the home. If you're talking severe reactions, um, in the two and a half years I've been with CSI Pharmacy, we've had one significant reaction where the patient went to the hospital. And again, that was, oh, with sub-Q? With sub-Q? I'm sorry. I thought you meant IVIG. I'm sorry. Um, with subcutaneous, no reactions. Um, the only reaction, like stated before, would be the localized redness um, and, and some swelling at the site from the fluid going in before it absorbs. Um, now, we do, with our five-year-old patient, what we do is numb the site with a little bit of numbing cream prior to his infusion. Um, so mom will place the cream on the leg, um, let it absorb for 15 minutes, wipe it off, and then begin the administration. Um, and they do very well. Every patient that is on Sub-Q is provided an EpiPen. Um, in pediatrics, it'd be the EpiPen Junior. junior um, and the parents are taught how to use that if they were to exhibit respiratory compromise. Um, and then they're instructed to call 911 and get the patient to the hospital. Um, but again, that's very rare. Uh, we have not encountered that with any of our patients. Um, the EpiPen is just there for safety. I wanted to ask, when I do my IVIG, we run it over 58 hours um, because I get really, really awful side effects. I um, get really bad aseptic meningitis, and we do pre-meds all the way throughout and dose of steroids before, and then follow it up with, I think it's a three-day taper off of steroids afterwards. So I wanted to ask if, since I have such a severe reaction to that, if there was a higher chance of me getting a reaction using sub-Q. So I don't know if I really know the answer to that. I would say yes, because it's not like subcutaneous is perfect. It almost sounds that way from this presentation, but there, there can be side effects. Um, um, however, they're they are, as, as in the presentation stated, um, much fewer systemic reactions. You're just not getting that high blood level of Ig. Now, in your situation, that is about uh, the most aggressive case of, of being treated to prevent side, side effects that I know of. We have over 200 patients, over 50 of them on subcutaneous, and, and there's probably a good reason you're in the hospital being treated that way. Um, but yeah, I would definitely talk to your physician about it. Uh, because that is, uh, that, that's got to be very challenging. I also wanted to ask um, if you had any tips on how to talk to your doctor or physician about switching to sub-Q or trying it, especially since there's only two cases right now children. of children. I think that um, we, as pediatric rheumatologists, are just not... Um, familiar with using it for patients with autoimmune disease. Um, I think the first step is to is for physicians or providers to educate themselves that 
it's been used in the context of adult myositis. So there are some published articles. That's what doctors like to read, a publication, which means someone wrote it up scientifically and other people reviewed it and they said, this, this is good science, we're going to publish it. So I was just looking online today, and there are, are scientific publications of groups of adult myositis patients who have received it. I think one question that I have that I would probably want to ask um, someone who is more familiar with immunology is whether one of the things that one of our thoughts is that the reason that these IVIG works is that you infuse a large amount of antibodies suddenly, and it covers all of those white blood cells, so it's kind of a quick way to kind of really change the way that the white blood cells are functioning. And so that probably happens at a slower way, in a slower manner, when you're getting it sub-Q. Um, but it sounds like from at least what's been published, the question is, are there people who have gone from IVIG to sub-Q who did poorly and that hasn't been published? That's the question. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of debate about that, whether or not that peak is really important with IVIG. And with IVIG, when it's given, you get this rapid peak. And then over the next three to four weeks, it really comes down because antibodies are eliminated, you know, have a half-life of about three to four weeks, so they're gone. So it, is that peak important, or is it about getting up to a certain level and maintaining that level, and that being an effective level? And, you know, those, those answers aren't really out there. Um, you know, we are seeing in the kids with primary immune deficiency, there's a lot of data which that's a different type of disease. It's not, it's not being uh, the same mechanism for, it's more of a replacement therapy. Um, but patients are doing very well. With auto, other autoimmune disorders like CIDP, it's, it's approved, it's on label, FDA approved, how Zentra is for C, CIDP, in which we would think the mechanism would be similar to that that, um, that we, we'd see with dermatomyositis. What is the minimum sites that you can put in and the maximum? And then if you put in the maximum, is that because you only want to sit there for an hour with your infusions or? So with the sites, it's evenly dispersed. We're not controlling that unless there was a reason to. Once in a great while, you will get a small amount of blood in the tubing that starts to kind of flow backwards, at that point you would clamp off that site and not use it. Um, but, but right now all four sites are going simultaneously and it's evenly administered. So it's for the maximum that you can... The, we can go up to eight sites. Um, there is a trial that's starting out for Hyzentra for dermatomyositis. So that is um, beginning now. So, yes, so, um, so we are going to see. Um, myasthenia gravis is the next one that's going to, that the trial is already f completed. And so that will be the next indication. And then myositis is being started. So, um, more, so we, we've already seen a lot of journal articles published. So they've seen the data that CSL Bering has now decided to invest in to go for an FDA indication. So that shows that we're moving in the right direction. This is a question for those who um, are getting sub-Q already. Um, so the, um, I, I'll call it a nodule, I don't know what to call it, the medication under the skin once it's administered, um, does it, um, I would say more towards Maddie because of your youth, um, is it, uh, enough to where it would bother you so that maybe others might be able to see it so that, you know, maybe wearing shorts tomorrow is not necessarily on your plan because you're doing your sub-Q injections today. Um, I think I'm going to wake up tomorrow and you probably wouldn't be able to tell that I just did it. You know, you said that uh, you couldn't feel it when you inserted the needle and everything. Is it, would it be similar to maybe uh, like an acupuncture needle? Like, uh, is it that kind of, uh, just from a relative perspective? Pro I think it's a little bigger because there is times where I can feel it and I just take it out real quick, put some, like wipe it down with uh, the alcohol wipe and retry it just because I probably like hit a nerve or just went in the wrong angle. But it's really easy just to, pick up and see where your fat is and stick it right in without feeling it. Um, 
What are, do we know the risks of long-term IVIG? I can confidently answer that only because it was asked this morning in the general session. Um, so we, there are not any published risks that we know of for long-term IVIG. And um, I think what makes us very comfortable about that is the fact that patients who don't make antibodies and have to get replacement antibodies for a replacement IVIG or sub-QIG for lifetime uh, don't sustain risks from getting the infusions over a very long, long period of time. 